I heard there's lots of old world buildings in Cleveland. I think we should do an exploration of old world buildings in Cleveland. You know, I'm by winning. Are those chili dogs over there? Gentlemen, a toast to our old world exploration of Cleveland. I'm by winning. I've got one gear. Go. I'm banging seven chili dogs. Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel, and today we're conducting an exploration of Cleveland. Cleveland gets our attention because this is a city on Lake Erie, supposedly founded in 1796 by General Moses Cleveland, a revolutionary general who was part of the Connecticut militia during the Revolutionary War. For some reason, they dropped the A from Cleveland, and we see in the early pictures of it going from just three simple houses to the early 1800s when we see a more modest settlement. Of course, these are drawings, and they could represent anything and be done by anybody. So, you know, if we saw giant pyramids or something else there, perhaps we shouldn't be too surprised. Maybe we could even say it's a more accurate representation. But we come to our usual bird's eye view of Cleveland, which seems to be when they actually got around to sorting out the city and dividing it up into what areas it was supposed to be divided up into. As always with the history of Cleveland, it really has no history from its founding in 1796 until the United States Civil War. There is mention of it being incorporated as a city prior to that, and then the fact that it served as a stop on the Underground Railroad, although no mention of any specific African Americans who were able to escape through Cleveland. But we see the early pictures from the Civil War time frame, and we have our usual militia congregation, or U.S. volunteers, and we always have the questionable time about the Civil War. Look at that building in the background there. Supposedly a picture from the 1860s, and we have a very well-built-out, developed building with multiple chimneys, and it's huge. Is this a mansion or an administrative building of some sort? Or is this just the building where the militia decided to gather? Because it's a very beautiful building. Looks like it's about five stories, and who knows if it has a basement. Couldn't really find anything on the history of this particular building. But regardless, it shows that there's already a built-out area in Cleveland, and here's the so-called Gilded Age with some very beautiful houses that apparently they just decided to dedicate the effort to doing, even having some nice fences, and this is supposedly circa 1870. So we've already got a lot of questions about Cleveland right off the bat. What's truly going on here? We don't really have much history again from its founding in 1796 to the Civil War. And we only see a couple scattered photos, which give us the impression that there are some incredible buildings. And here's a photo from the 1890s where we see large buildings, skyscrapers already built out. A large clock tower. One of my favorite commenters on the St. Louis video told me that the reason there's tall towers is because there's hills around the city. Now, why that would have anything to do with the desire to construct tall towers, I don't know. Maybe so the city can be seen over the hills? Or you can see out over the hills from the city? I'm not sure. And remember that Cleveland's located on Lake Erie, so why would there be a need for that? We also see some very built-up industry and manufacturing capabilities and some very incredible buildings to do so, with many chimneys and smokestacks. Of course, we'll be told this makes perfect sense because manufacturing was big in Cleveland. One historical note is that Standard Oil was founded in Cleveland by Rockefeller in 1870 before he moved it to New York City. Look at some of these smokestacks and how advanced they look, along with some of these buildings. Are these houses? Are these administrative buildings? Again, more questions as we look at overall photos of Cleveland and its manufacturing past. Of course, who's to know what's the truth on these photos, because we also have our usual inconsistencies with them that we've grown so accustomed to viewing. So, once again, raising more questions than it answers. And even in some of the photos with better visual acuity to them, we still see many questionable things. Some of the smokestacks seem like they're from some sort of different time. We'll be reassured that, no, of course, those were the smokestacks that they used in that time frame, and after the United States Civil War, it was the Second Industrial Revolution. Well, again, here looking at Cleveland in the late 19th century, we see many questionable things. Very developed buildings, skyscrapers, with a lot of detail to them, the classic towers. And then, of course, we have what looks to be a more detailed administrative building, and we see many towers in the distance, and a lot of activity, along with the streetcars, or the electric trolleys, many of them. 
Looks like we've got our little war memorial there. Of course, to the Civil War, what else would it be? Soldiers and Sailors Monument, something that was easily constructed in the midst of all those incredible buildings and was probably done in a short period of time. Just incredible, though, looking at all the built-out detail and infrastructure that was already present in this city. It defies simple explanation, and yet we see the cheap advertising that's thrown on the side of the buildings. And yet in other photos, what we see here in apparent road construction, it just looks like there's a lot of junk all over the place. And why do we always see that in these early photos? It never really makes a lot of sense. As though they just wanted to operate and live their lives in the midst of junk as they were trying to do construction. Or would it make more sense that they were simply cleaning up what they found in the city when the city was founded? And that they simply had to remove a lot of this. This is a rather strange picture as well, because here it looks like another cleanup effort, although ostensibly it's supposed to be construction, that's the impression we're supposed to be given, but we see a very old building off to the left. And don't tell me that's russification on the stone. That is such a lame explanation that does not stand up to scrutiny. And what is with those figures in the distance? Again, many more questions being raised just when we look at the overview of Cleveland. And we're just looking at different photos all the way from 1860 until present. Here is the Connor Palace Theater, and that's what it's called. Very gorgeous theater from the early 1920s. And really, you can't even say that this is Art Deco because this theater was built slightly before Art Deco just magically came out of France. Look at the roof and the ceiling and the walls. And then here's the entryway to the Connor Palace Theater. Just incredible beauty and detail. And of course we have columns and it looks like we've got another very well-developed ceiling with beautiful chandeliers. And it looks like marble banisters on the stairway. Just incredible beauty and solid construction. And you go in there and feel that. That's Terminal Tower in Cleveland, our patented Art Deco building. And of course we see how it looks when it was just constructed. And yet it looks like they're cleaning up a mess again. Well, maybe they were. It was a construction site, right? Yes, this is one of the first buildings we'll be taking a look at, and already we have so many different questions. In the background, we see other large buildings that are already constructed, and it looks like we have a mix of debris and a mix of many other things. So let's begin with examining Terminal Tower, another one of our one-year wonders from the Art Deco period, built from 1926 to 1927 for some railroad barons whose names really aren't important, and another one that was designed by an architectural firm. So I'm under the impression that by the 1920s they'd finally gotten the realization that maybe it's better that they just assign the credit for designing these buildings to architectural firms instead of single architects who have hundreds of buildings to their credit. When we look at the terminal tower, we see incredible Art Deco beauty, although we suspect that this is from another civilization. And we see some of the columns towards the base of this incredible building. And we also see how large it is. It has a very large base and a tower on the base. So something that seems to go with the so-called Art Deco period. I'm really beginning to wonder in the previous civilization if the Art Deco buildings were from the latter part of it or the earlier part. Look at the beauty in that tower. And we see the pillars and the high rise of the tower. And of course we see what would clearly be defined as what we call Antiquitech, some ability to harness power from the atmosphere and the air. I suspect that these Art Deco buildings were probably built during the middle period of the previous civilization, but that's just a theory. And I base that suspicion on the fact that they do have a lot of beauty in the areas that they seem to pop up in in many of the major cities that are either on rivers or major waterways. And here we see a greater wide angle shot of it and we can get an idea of its size and immensity. This was the tallest building in Ohio until the completion of the Key Tower in Cleveland in the 1990s. So a very impressive architectural wonder and something that stood the test of time. And here looking closer at the entryway and we see some of the beautiful columns and the detail within the building itself. And just imagine all that material going into that. Well, we do have some construction photos we're going to take a look at. And as you may have guessed, these construction photos have the usual intricacies of beautiful detail and non-questionable authenticity. Look at this view from the top of the tower and just looking at some of the very large blocks and of course the very ornate and decorative detailing that always goes into these buildings. 
Is it form or is it function with the beauty of it? That's always the question we have with these Art Deco buildings, and that's probably why they garner our attention so much. Yes, here we are with our construction photo. And of course, we're not even going to bother showing the foundation of the building because we'd want to see that. Look at all those very, very blurry cranes and girders. And I don't think I see a single individual at work here. This almost feels like it's a ghost photo, as though they didn't even really bother to try that hard to make it look convincing. Now, maybe we could say this is a little bit better of a photo. Of course, it's the usual aspect where we see the tower mostly complete and the rest of the structure mostly complete. And they're just finishing the top of the tower, much as we see with many state capitals where they still have a dome to finish. I'm definitely getting a little skittish when I look at these photos because it's the same thing over and over again. And why is it always so perfect at the level of construction? They said, okay, we reached this level, now stop. We gotta take the photo. Everybody go home. Take a break. Take a week break. It's never cold in Cleveland during the winter, just like Minnesota, is it? So obviously there was no problem in building this beauty in a year. And let's not forget the beautiful ornate detailing on the inside, because we're going to take a look at that too. This is a quote-unquote Art Deco building. And it's not an Art Deco building unless you have beauty on the outside and the inside. Again, these construction photos. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you what to think with them, but analyze them on your own and come to your own conclusions. It seems as though they're trying to give a different impression here with this, but we have the same problems. I mean, what kind of sequencing occurred with taking these photos? What kind of sequence did they use to construct this beautiful building? A terminal tower. An unrivaled, gorgeous building. Ah, oh, yes. Here's the top of the tower. And we just have the bare bones with it. Just a lot of girders that we're not going to put any kind of stones on, although we just saw that it has very large stones on it. So, what exactly kind of construction is this? I like how straight the flag is up there, too. And that's uh, pretty impressive. Is that really a flag, or is that something else? And then I like how you have these two gentlemen here just kind of poking around the construction site. <laughs> There's definitely something very surreal about this photo. And you see the same issue with scaling, even from the photo we saw earlier, with how something looks off with the size of the columns and the windows that are under construction. And there's a, already a fire hydrant there, so I don't know what to tell you. Here's the interior, and, and we have columns on the interior, and you'll never see construction photos showing construction of the interior or erection of these beautiful columns. And you also see on the ceiling the beautiful ornate detail, and look at the light there. Again, this building just gives so many different vibes of a futuristic aspect to it. All the beautiful design in it. And what's the purpose behind it? Office space for a couple railroad tycoons? Look, if we don't have those columns in there, that's not going to meet our needs. And you look and you see columns and pillars everywhere. And you even see the small arches in the ceiling going back as far as the eye can see. It's not just the fact that this building is tall, it's also the fact that this building covers so much area. So many materials to fill out the area. And then, of course, the floor. Here's just a random office space in the same building. And we see similar beautiful construction that we noticed when we looked at the tower in Rochester, the single Art Deco building, the Plumber Building. Well, now we see it here in Terminal Tower in Cleveland. Because, of course, you're going to have a very beautiful and decked out office section. And then you have your beautiful elevators, because again, Art Deco, you need to have the most beautiful elevators with the gorgeous doors, and why not have a beautiful ceiling, too, in the elevator room? You need to be reminded that you're in a beautiful elevator room, and that these are incredible elevators. I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to tell us those doors are made out of gold. And here's the entryway, and look at the ceiling there. This is just unbelievable with these large blocks and the detail on the ceiling. And it's not just the detail, it's the fact that it's so extensive. Really? They completed this in a year? And then, of course, we see the floor as well. Nope, no construction photos of this. And here's what it looks like today. And you see how beautiful the ceiling is. But then you also see the arches and the way the decoration goes into each one of those grooves, into the arches. I find it very difficult to believe or to even fathom that this building could have been built in under 10 years, let alone one. And on to President James A. Garfield's memorial. Naturally, we have to look at a tomb, and this was built from 1885 to 1890. And as this being the 19th century, we can give credit to a single architect, who is George Keller. Really hard to say what the origin of this building was, and 
you have to speculate that perhaps this was a building that they came across and they had no idea how they were going to repurpose this. Do we say it's a church? Do we say it's a standalone tower? Do we tear it down? Hey, I've got an idea. Let's dedicate it to a president. This looks like it would make a great memorial, a great monument. Certainly someone would buy this. And typically we'd expect them to repurpose a building like this as a tomb. Regardless, it's an incredibly beautiful building and I wonder how old it truly is and what its original function actually was. Because we do see many of the hallmarks that we see on churches, aside from the reliefs that seem to have been added at a later time. And look at all the little arches and details in the tower. Five years to do this with these kind of stones, the steps, and everything else. And I would love to hear the Russification explanation again for why the stone looks so old already. It's quite incredible, though, the different coloring on it and looking at it at different angles. And George Keller had uh, quite a reputation for being an expert in Civil War monuments. And Civil War monuments are questionable in and of themselves, in addition to the conflict. You look at different perspectives of this building, and it almost reminds me of one of those churches that you would see over in Cappadocia in Turkey. There's a lot of similarities with it, and that's why I'm kind of surprised they didn't go all the way and just uh, repurpose this as a church and instead decided to declare it a memorial. And here's even a photo from the 1890s, and it already looks old. So again, it goes along with that theme. And we'll be told, well, it's just architectural processes, russification of the stone, it's an architectural process, and that's why it already looks old, even right after it's built. Yes, of course. How convenient. Looking at the interior, though, and we see columns on the inside of this building, too. And incredible beauty on this dome structure on the inside. So, this is definitely one that you have to wonder what the original purpose behind it was. Was it some sort of religious building in the religion of the previous civilization? It's really hard to say. Yes, we have that added in statue of James Garfield. But look at that with the way those columns go all the way to the ceiling. Very beautiful. And the arches and everything else. I, I just don't see how you could accept that this, they would go to this level of effort for James Garfield. I don't know. Was he that great of a president? Well, you know, his tomb is smaller than Grant's tomb. But th they both had colored reputations. Look at the beauty and how shiny those columns are towards the base. Just amazing. And what's the original symbol there that's under the statue that seems to have been added later? Here's a photo of George Keller, the architect extraordinaire who was an expert in Civil War monuments. And we've come across him a couple times, although we haven't really talked about him before in previous explorations. Of course, talking about how in the 19th century they credited it to a single architect and not an architectural firm. This is one of his other masterpieces, an arch that sits out in front of the state capitol in... Connecticut because you know you need to have a beautiful arch as part of your Civil War monument <laughs> so I wonder why would you construct an arch as a Civil War monument here but a column or a pillar somewhere else why not both and now on to the Cleveland Arcade so the Cleveland Arcade an indoor shopping arcade that was constructed in 1890 and They'll say that this connects two Victorian era structures and it's a five story arcade. Very beautiful and again I'm concerning myself with what the original purpose of this building was. The skylight is utterly beautiful and here in these earlier photos we see some of the detail with the construction of the stairway. All hard material, rock, poured concrete, limestone, who knows for sure. This is definitely a place I would love to get to in person and examine very carefully as it's still standing today. But a shopping center from 1890. That just feels like a bit of a stretch. I almost consider the fact that maybe that skyline or that skylight could have opened or it was open and it allowed some different kind of access in the past. This is just another one of those structures that defies simple explanation within the historical account that we're given and concerning what other buildings could be. And this is what it looks like on the outside, the entryway to the arcade. Yes, 1890. The capabilities that we had, it just baffles the mind. 
And for some reason, we just don't bother to build like this today. Well, I know everyone will tell me it's because we don't have the artisans and people just don't work so hard today. So this is the Citizens Building built in 1903. Yet another bank, because what else would it be? As you see by the pediment and, or the pediment and the large columns towards the ground. I've never quite seen a building exactly like this before. 1903. And this is a photo from before 1910, the very early 1900s. But just look at the base of this building, and we see that classic uh, Roman appeal. I guess you need that to know that you're going into a bank. And then looking towards the top of it, and just looking at the beauty and the detail and the windows on the top floor. And then we have parapets. Because, well, what else would you have in a building in 1903? This is quite a unique building, and I haven't quite seen its like before, and I dare say there's something about it that exceeds the Art Deco in a way, especially when we look at the base with the pediment yet again, and the detail on the pediment. should be noted that this was constructed the exact same time as the New York Stock Exchange, and it looks exactly the same. And it also looks like you could be in Rome. Well, now they call it the City Club Building, but it still stands today, so you can still go examine it, and it's holding up just fine. I'll tell you what, they really built them to last back in 1903. Very beautiful, and look at all the detail and effort that had to go into that kind of construction. Once again, and here's the interior. Yeah, that has a bit of a bank appearance to it. Look at the floor, the walls, and the ceiling, and the beauty, and the detail, and all the hard materials that went into that. Could only do it in 1903. Those artisans, they were everywhere. Which uh, group of immigrants were in Cleveland that could be given credit for? Because, you know, I got a lot of comments on the Cincinnati video about the German immigrants. And now we go to the Marble Room. And this is a gorgeous building. This started out as another bank that was actually started by the sons of James Garfield himself. And you can see on the outside, we've got the same thing with the large columns and the small pediment over the, or pediment over the door. And originally it was a National City Bank of Cleveland, but now it's been converted into a very beautiful restaurant. And we'll take a look at it in a second. But <laughs> look at the size of those columns and the large blocks. Well, of course it's a bank, and you would know and think it's a bank. Could also be a library or something else. And there's a picture of uh, President James A. Garfield. Mm, it's a very interesting looking individual, and his associations with Cleveland are well known, and that's why he had his majestic tomb in Cleveland. And his sons were responsible for building what was originally a bank. But uh, somebody with a very enterprising and brilliant mind, and I've got to give him credit for, have converted this bank into a restaurant called the Marble Room. Look at this. Now, this is a place I would love to sit down and have dinner in. Well, I would love to sit down and have all three meals in this room. Look at these beautiful columns and the beautiful ceiling. And look at that lighting. This is just otherworldly. I don't know, I'm not wondering if they've filmed many scenes from many movies in this, because look at the beauty and the detail. This is something that has you artistically inspired, and I think this would make even a McDonald's hamburger taste like high-class dining, just looking around and seeing this kind of beauty all around you. This is definitely a place I would love to stop in and eat at personally when I get to Cleveland. Look at the ceiling, and just the way that the columns are arrayed around the room. A marble room. I don't know, that name just doesn't even seem to do it justice. You need to call it something such as, you know, maybe the Zeus room or... I don't know. I'm at a loss for words on this one. Just incredible beauty and whoever came up with the idea to turn it into a dining room and a restaurant, that is very inspired. Because I have no doubt that they have no issue filling out their reservations all the time. And this is definitely a restaurant that I can see succeeds very easily. Naturally, it's highly rated looking at it. Okay, and now we're going on to the Cleveland Public Library. They go so far as to say that this library was founded in 1869, although who knows when this one was constructed. There's all kinds of details about an architectural competition. They built another one in 1916. There's many different libraries across Cleveland, but we see the same beauty with the very large foundation stones and the stairway. Strangely enough, we also see access to the basement for some inexplicable reason. And then we have the many different columns, because what else would you have on a library? Ah, uh, yes, it's a popular destination wedding area, and I can see why. Look at the size of those stones there. Very beautiful, even with some of the coloring on them. And again, this building gives you the impression of otherworldly. Look at those lions or griffins up there. 
above the window. Interesting detail across it. And then even looking in the windows itself. This is just a library. I don't think you could really call this a modest library, though. And looking at the interior with some of the banisters, the stairways, and then the interior construction of the walls, again, it looks like all solid masonry. Or are we to believe that uh, it's merely a facade that covers a bunch of bricks? Not sure, but in any event, it looks like a very beautiful building. And when was it really built? Was it built in 1869? Was it founded then? Was it built later after the competition in 1916? Was it built originally in 1869 and then added to in 1916? Hard to say, and I don't think it really matters. Yes, this is just a library. <laughs> you know, I, I just have to go to Cleveland because you know, I could sit down for a fine meal, enjoy a McDonald's burger as fine dining because I see all these beautiful columns, and then I could go to the library, and I would feel very cultured and very educated just by seeing these kind of things. So again, I ask, why don't we do this today? Why don't we build our libraries and our schools and our administration buildings like this today? Even our government buildings. You might actually go enjoy going down to your local government building and doing your business walking on stairways like this. And some of them are still built like this. Of course, you'll have the naysayers that'll tell you, it's just a government building. There's nothing beautiful or unique about this. <laughs> yes, and they want to say other people are wearing tinfoil hats. Yes, I could just walk on this and not notice anything. But the scary thing is there are a lot of people that are conditioned to do just that. Imagine touching that banister, feeling that beautiful marble, the granite, the limestone, and not thinking anything of it. Just incredible on the inside of this library, looking at the floor and the ceiling and the way the arches meet together. There's something that just reaches you at a deeper level when you really appreciate the beauty and what was really the function of this building original, originally. And look there, once again, we see the scaling in the columns next to the doors. Because why not? Now, it just seems as though there were so many columns available, and yet I think one of the greatest things I lament... Oh, and speaking of columns, this is one of the quote-unquote Carnegie libraries, so this is a different structure. Look at these columns, and look at how incredibly beautiful they are, and how dressed up and detailed they are. Yes, of course, this is something else that's attributed to Andrew Carnegie. I think someone uh, questioned me and asked if I was an admirer of Andrew Carnegie, which I find quite hilarious that someone would ever get that impression. But I know sometimes my sarcasm can be a little direct, and it probably doesn't translate very well in other languages. But no, I'm not an admirer. Everything's just named after Carnegie for some reason. And here's another portion of the library, because as if the other two structures aren't enough, you need to have another beautiful old world building for your library in Cleveland. Yes, I don't know, just so many cities I need to get to and visit in person. I mean, you know, it's funny that Cleveland doesn't exactly have the best reputation, and yet when you look at it, you see that it's unbelievably gorgeous and beautiful. Sort of the same thing with uh, Philadelphia, and it's funny how the mainstream seems to keep this in the news, that they don't want to encourage the beauty in these cities. And now we move on to the Trust Rotunda building. The full name of this building is actually the Cleveland uh, Trust Company building, and this was built another one in 1907. Funny that they had all these buildings built in the very early 20th century. And this was designed by architect George B. Post, so we were still in the habit of assigning one singular architect instead of a firm credit for these buildings. This is a very unique one, though, because we see a couple different pediments. And, of course, it's a bank because, you know, pediments, banks, kill columns and pillars. Yeah, we have the dome on it, so it's not the democracy. It's the dome of banking. Looking on the inside of this, though, it looks like it's since become more of a shop. It's moved on from its humble banking roots. Again, look at the beauty on the inside and look at some of the detail there on the ceiling. Early 20th century, you know, even before Art Deco, as though no detail was spared. The archways and the beautiful dome, almost as though this is some sort of miniature state capitol building. Very interesting. And we'll take a look at the glass that's actually up in the dome, and that's an incredible beauty in and of itself. But when you see the painting and the way the columns and the pillars all match together, and then looking up and seeing how it all meets when you look straight up, that is unbelievable beauty, especially the lighting on that. That's something that gives you that otherworldly feeling. And I always have that feeling whenever I go into any kind of state capital or any building with a dome, and I look up in the dome and I see this kind of beautiful ornate detail. It's almost as though you're looking at some sort of special window that's a portal or 
it gives you a gateway to a different world. I think this is something that's lost in architecture, and whether it was lost from the old world or some aspect of the old world and what function it originally served, you can just think on all the people who were going in and looking at this. Well, here's the Central High School, and this is a photo from the 1870s, and of course it's a high school because it has a very beautiful tall tower on it, and we see some very wondrous construction techniques on it, such as putting the windows down in the ground for some reason, I'm not sure why. Can you imagine going to a high school like that every day? Well, this is the new one, the Central High School. This was built in the 1940s. We don't really hear of many buildings that were constructed in the 1940s. It's sort of that strange period that's during World War II, and it's in between the Art Deco slash Great Depression and prior to the brutalist architecture that swept over the Western world in the 1950s, even though it was trying to resist communism. Well, now let's move on to the new West Side Market House. So, as the name implies, this is a market, and we'll be told that this is built in the early 20th century. They completed it in 1912 after five years of construction, so a little bit better of a construction timeline. Neoclassical Byzantine architecture? I think I'm going to go with uh, airship hangar architecture or airship revival. What is that tower for? And don't tell me it's because Cleveland is surrounded by hills. This is for a market? What was the original intention behind this building? Because when you look on the inside of it, I'm definitely given the impression of one of those old design photos we saw from those brilliant French designers or recorders. And to me, it looks more like a hanger of some sort, or it has some other function. It certainly wasn't meant to be a market. Look at all the unused space in that. That does not make any sense. And now the Peace of Resistance, one of the oldest buildings in Cleveland, Gray's Armory. So the story we have behind this building is very interesting. They tell us that this building was built for the Cleveland Grays, a private military company that was founded in 1837. They claim this beautiful castle building was built in 1894. So already we have a conflicting account right there. Does that look like anything that would come out of 1894? Who is building a castle in 1894 and why? Why is there a private military company in Cleveland in 1837 that operated for a number of years? What about the militia? What about the regular United States Army? Strange because it's during that gray area of history we have. So I guess Cleveland grays is very fitting. Look how incredibly beautiful and modern looking this building is despite being constructed of large blocks. I find it very difficult to believe that this was constructed in the 1890s. I'd find it very difficult to believe that they said this was constructed in the 1830s. I also find it difficult to believe, again, that there was a private military company. What was this, Metal Gear 4 in 1837? If anybody gets that reference, let me know in the comments. But this building just defies all explanation because it's our classic castle and yet it seems to be a more detailed and well-built castle with much thicker walls and more masonry construction. They always called it the Cleveland Grays Armory. So I wonder what happened to this private military company. I'm going to have to dig into that a little bit more because I'm just astounded that there was a private military company during the age of militias and the very small regular United States Army, which conveniently happened to go right to mass mobilization during the Civil War. And look at this beauty from this angle. And you see those very large base stones, and then it looks like it's brick construction, although <laughs> we see such amazing, beautiful detail with the slopes of the brick, and then, of course, the little turrets that are added onto it. Now, how defensible would that really be with the technology of the 1890s? Remember, we had our nuclear tip mortars from the United States Civil War, so why would you bother putting this kind of effort into a building if it's some sort of military function? But let's be honest, that's what they always call these castles. They're always considered armories or something along the like. Well, I'm surprised they just didn't consider this one some sort of music concert hall. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, and right there they put it 1837 to 1893. So what the heck is that in reference to? Is that when the building was built? Was that when the private military company was in existence? Why would they put that on the side of the building? Nothing about this makes any sense. Conflicting accounts, conflicting architecture and in a building that's just such a large anomaly that you can't explain it. Look at the entryway there. And again, you see the small column showing the scaling and the very large stones in the archway. There's just something about this building that defies all explanation. What was the purpose of this building when it was originally built? And don't tell me that it was built for a private military company. Here's the interior. 
And this defies a military explanation as well. We needed our nice, solid wooden interior with our pillars holding up the ceiling. And I don't know. What's the floor really made out of? This building is just such an anomaly from many perspectives. Let me know what you think of this one in the comments. Ah, here's our well-equipped office. And look at that. Even beautiful windows there. Woodwork as far as the eye can see. Well, Cleveland's definitely a city it looks like I have to visit, and I certainly invite you to explore it on your own. Thank you for joining me today. It's been a very enjoyable exploration.